everybody! Hi, friends! Well, from beautiful Salt Lake City, Utah, it's Thank God I'm Atheist, the podcast. I'm Frank Feldman. And I'm Dan Beecher. And coming up on the show today, Dan, big revelation about the Mormon church and which, which sex none abuse. of us could have seen coming. <laughs> shocking! <laughs> shocking news that a religion has covered oh, up foul no. deeds. Uh, so we're going to get into the particulars of how they did it. Yeah. Of course, it's, uh, the story's chock full of lawyers. That makes sense. That makes sense. <laughs> Mormons are lawyered up, you guys. <laughs> or at least, sorry, the Mormon church is lawyered up. Yeah, that's true. Yes. All they right. Are, but they are in it for them. And we're going to uh, to talk about it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but first, we've got um, some some stories, some Things that happened in the news this week. Indeed. Um, and I'm going to start with one, Dan. Um, down there in Georgia. Boy, heard it's, it. it's going to be the place to go if you are pregnant and you want a tax deduction. <laughs> um, because what they are up to, their uh, Department of Revenue has uh, announced that they would begin to, quote, recognize any unborn child with a detectable human heartbeat uh, as eligible for an individual income tax dependent exemption (laughs) worth up to $3,000 a year. Basically they're giving, they're extending the uh, child um, tax break, tax break to people who uh, have a bun in the oven. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so they called um, our bluff is what they did. Cause like one of our arguments has always been, well, if they're, if they're people <laughs> can a pregnant woman drive in the, in the carpool lane, can we blah, blah, which blah. somebody recently tried pregnant legit. person. Sorry. Yeah. Um, um, but yeah, uh, okay, fine. You know, I, I at least they're making it a, a goofball attempt at consistency. <laughs> Yeah, if nothing else, right? But they're not being fully consistent because the 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 example that you just stated, the one of the uh, uh, HOV lane right. or the the high occupancy lane, um, a, a, a woman in Texas uh, tried that recently, and she's she's actually um, she's going to go to court and she's going to try out her argument there yeah. in her defense um, in order to try to avoid <laughs> a traffic ticket. It's kind of insane. It's absolutely Here's, insane because the thing is, like, just because there's a detectable heartbeat, which is how they're defining it. Also, uh, there isn't six, by after the way. six weeks. Well, but that's that's what they're saying. That's how right. they've, they've defined this thing. Um, you know, um, miscarriages often happen. Yeah, right? in it's still in that that uh, that first trimester. So what the state's going to be giving out tax breaks? For, for miscarriages too, right? Yeah, I mean, like, like it's insanity what I, they're opening up here. I had a person for a month, so does that count? Yeah, uh, apparently, according to what they're saying, it does. Yeah, it's that's uh, it. It's a it's it's the stupidest can of worms to open. Oh, but they're they're opening it. They are. They're yeah. just gonna crack that can. <laughs> So there you go. All right. Well, way to go, ding dongs. They're they're so dumb. Can I just, by the way, say that the argument has never been about it. Our argument has doesn't need to be about whether or not a fetus is a person. It is literally the body body autonomy argument. All right. the only thing that matters is can you compel a person to give up or, or or to use their body in a way that they don't wish to, to support the life of another body. And if you don't think that you can, and like, you know, for those of you who want to make this argument with family and friends, don't, I mean, I think don't bother, but if you do, <laughs> you just say, can I, you know, if I need, if, if, if some stranger needs a liver, can the government force you to you know, to to get to give up half of your liver as a liver transplant to a person, and if they say no, then you can't. Then the government can't also force you 
to use your body to support the life of a fetus. It's right. just it's it's just such a it the personhood of that fetus is completely irrelevant to the question. Yeah, anyway, it, it needs, you know, grow up fetus. Yeah. You want to live? Support your own damn body. <laughs> you can't you can't use mine. <laughs> okay. Sorry. All right. Uh, I'm, I, I'm going to talk, I, I'm going to delve into a world that I don't, I, I had no intention of delving into. Uh, but here we go there. Imagine if you will, being a member of two groups, neither of which accepts the other. It's oh. such a, it, it's a difficult position. Okay. Uh, and, 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 and one that we should all have <laughs> compassion for, um, this is a story from the uh, from the religion news service uh, about uh, one of the groups is Christians. Mm -hmm. So these these are Christians in, uh, but they belong to another group that does not accept them, and it's so sad. Mm. Um, the furries. Uh, mm. okay. If you're unfamiliar with furries, these are people who uh, who enjoy dressing, uh, assuming a. This is their word, not mine. Fursona, mm -hmm. uh, which is which is a uh, they they have a character that they play right. uh, that involves a fursuit, a big uh, mascot like costume, correct? In which they are, uh, you know, some sort of small woodland creature or something. Usually a fox or a dog or cat, something like that. Pandas? And, do they ever do they ever go more exotic? I. I can't imagine that they don't. I would think they'd have to. You got to have a panda furry out there every now and then. Yeah. Yeah. Kangaroo furry? I don't I I don't know the word. Are there whale furries? Are there aquatic furries? I don't know. I don't know the answer to these questions. I, uh, I have not delved deeply into the furry culture. You know we have furry listeners. Sure, guaranteed. Yeah. I'm not look, I'm I got nothing against furries. I, I actually have a friend who's a furry. Oh really? Uh, huh. just, I mean, I I know him peripherally, but uh, but yeah, he uh, he he made a whole big thing about it on Facebook, and I was like, okay, there you go. Like he came out as a furry. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Interesting. Okay. Uh, anywho, uh, the thing about the furry community that I do know is that it is very sex positive. Mm -hmm. uh, it is a uh, very LGBTQ positive, include especially. I mean, I think actually. It might be LGBTQ majority. Really? Yeah. There's there's uh, huh, I, okay. there's some evidence that that might be the case. If not, it's very heavily. Uh, there's a they're, they're they're very LGBTQ positive, mm -hmm. which makes it very difficult for those sad Christian furries. <laughs> 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 they just don't approve. Who don't of the who LGBTQ? Just, yeah, and all this contingent. sex positivity. It's uh. So oh, why are they getting, uh, what why why are they furries? Then? Yeah, well, okay. So I think part of the thing of being a furry, and actually, I can totally see how this could work, is that it is about it gives you a layer of anonymity, or it gives you a sort of distance from a personalized self. Uh huh. And. You know, I've read people's accounts of feeling like they've actually built up their self-esteem and been been able to sort of, you know, th these were people that were not very good in social situations okay. and were very afraid in social situations. And just having that sense of distance, that one, you know, step of removal just huh. gave them the ability to sort of build up their confidence and build up their uh, their social skills. Interesting. Okay, which I'm I'm down for. I think that's um that's awesome. Uh, but and yeah, there are probably plenty of Christians who could use some better social skills. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, it, it it's sad when you're in conflicting yeah. groups that are both very important to you. So what's going? So what's what's happening? Like, are is there well, going to be a schism? Is there? <laughs> Oh my God. 
All I want in the world now is for there to be a break off group of furries that are just the saddest. <laughs> Christ, they just do church furry, furry church. <laughs> oh, church. God, you can't imagine a more depressing group of humans than people who are like trying to figure out a way to celebrate themselves in the only way they know how, but they can't actually get all the way to right. the, the good things that furrydom. Uh, Gives people. <laughs> oh, wow. Yikes. Well, All right. Know. Well, good luck, Christian furries. <laughs> Maybe, hopefully you fall on the correct side of which one to leave. Yeah. I mean, it is sort of, I'm, I'm, I'm confused. Like I just have to, to say it because it's like, you know, like any sort of like my perception of furries is that it's, it is about sex and that's totally as an outsider. I don't know much about it. Right. But I, that's just in my head. It's, I just thought it was, that's what it's about. I and so then of, he, I, I think that's probably a pretty reductionist view of it. I think a lot of people just see it as a fetish thing. And I okay. don't think that's actually the full thing. Yeah. So it's so. not just a kink of some kind. No, I think it's okay. more than that. Um, but, but, Okay. But yeah, I mean, clearly it has to be bigger than that. It clearly has to be tapping into something that's bigger than that. Right. Although if there's these Christians who are uncomfortable with that aspect of, yeah. Cause, cause while it's not just that it's that like, it's definitely a sex thing. They they are very sex positive and there is a, you know, there's a huge, it's a huge element of freedom to how that, that there's a, a sexual component to it. Yeah. So no, like, um, yeah, uh, my only exposure to it, there, there's a bar in town that does a furry night, mm. uh, a gay bar that does a furry night. Oh. At least they used to. Um, and we were just there one night because <laughs> why wouldn't you just go on a Tuesday night? Right. Sure. Just to go be with your people. It wasn't our people that night. It was, it was, um, it and was it was critters. fine, <laughs> but it was like, what is going on here? <laughs> I thought this was a gay bar. Oh, this isn't a that, furry bar. I want to f- I want to film that moment when the first furry walks in and everybody else in the bar goes, "Wait, what? What's happening?" <laughs> well, what? the staff knew what was going on. Oh we yeah, just, we just didn't know what was going on. Yeah. Anyway, that's, that's um, really funny. But it was fine. I mean, who yeah. cares? It's there. You go. One of the more just sort of open and accepting bars in town, and so of course Here's- that's where. Here's the question. Here, here's a question. Hmm? Uh, what what furry would Jesus be? Oh, he would be. Would he what be? Would he be? He'd be be a little hedgehog, I think. <laughs> <laughs> it's got to be meek, right? It can't be a, yeah. a predator. Yeah. <laughs> you got you got to go. You got to go with. Uh, it's yeah, not probably not a cat or a dog. You're right. Yeah. So so yeah, a little hedgehog. That's yeah. that's adorable. A gerbil. <laughs> Jesus the gerbil. And lo, he did say unto them, I am Hammy the hamster. Yeah. He wouldn't Look be a lamb. That would... Oh, he could have been a lamb. That's of course <laughs> what he is. Oh, he's a cute little lamb. Okay. We figured it out. All right, Jesus well... furry. <laughs> well, All last right. week on the show, Dan, we talked about uh, a story that I just have to follow up on. Um, it's the story of Bishop Lamar Whitehead, mm. uh, the, 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 the pastor in Brooklyn who was uh, held up on live stream during yeah. his, um, his normal weekly services. And, uh, and it's really, it's very interesting. This story has caught the attention of the media for some very kind of bizarre reasons. Apparently, uh, he uh, is a friend or an acquaintance of the current mayor of New York City. Oh, okay. Um, And uh, they're at least very familiar uh, with each other. Uh, Eric Adams is the current mayor of New York City. But people are like, well, who is this pastor guy? Uh, And in his And how did he get a million dollars worth of jewelry? Yeah, exactly. Uh, because his congregation is actually tiny. Um, if it's 50, 60 people, that's probably a good, a good service, oh. right? It's not a big church, 
but he does have a lot of money. Yeah. Uh, and uh, so the, his history is fascinating. His, his, uh, his father was killed by the police when he was just a baby. Um, and his dad was apparently like a respected businessman and uh, figure in, in, in the community. Uh, huh. And so he grows up. He goes to college in New Mexico, comes back to New York, becomes a, a mortgage broker. And then he sort of starts to get into some strange stuff. Uh, he starts to do identity theft. Oh, his girlfriend worked at a motorcycle dealership, I think it was. And so she had access to credit reports. It was a car dealership, sorry. And so he would use her login in order to steal people's identities and then go out oh and buy gosh. cars and motorcycles. And that's what, that's what got him in serious trouble. Uh, while he was already in prison for that, he another thing from his past caught up to him where he had uh, swindled $200,000 from um, an elderly client who he'd gotten uh, uh, helped with his mortgage for his home. He asked to borrow $200,000. The guy, and, and, and he said he would turn it around in a month's time and, and pay him $25,000 extra uh-huh. for, the, for the service. Right. Um, and of course, he just walks away with the $200,000. Uh, the, and the man didn't pull it out of savings. Not that that would have made it much better. He actually took out another mortgage on the home. Oh, uh, no. So he went into debt to give the guy $200,000. Oh, um, wow. And yeah, so he was already. Wow, so this guy was a real peach. Real peach. And so he gets out of prison in 2013 after serving five years. And he starts the leaders of tomorrow's ministry, right? Yeah. And then he um, somehow is like, he's got a Range Rover and a Mercedes Benz that um, he's just stopped making payments on. (laughs) Uh, So there's a $68,000 judgment against him. He wrote uh, in 2019, he wrote a $164,000 check uh, to the company that built his home, uh, in, uh, in New Jersey. It's like a $4.4 million home, um, with a pool, a gym, a wine cellar. Uh, the, the check bounced. Yeah. Um, you don't take a check for that. <laughs> you, you, that's just not how that works. So anyway, this guy is like crooked as can be. Right. And, um, there sounds like, and this is this is the thing that I think they're really looking into. The jewelry had a had a nice little insurance policy on it. Ah, shocking! Yeah, shocking that it was a scam and, from the beginning, <laughs> right? Well, people were people actually who watched the video were like, "This he seems like he knows what's going on," right? <laughs> um, yeah, so he's he's back to the pulpit. Uh, about 25 people attended this last week. Um, he says uh, in, in a video of the service, uh, he says, the devil didn't want me back in this pulpit. God said, you can't take his life. You can touch his material things, but you can't touch his soul. And then he goes about reenacting the robbery twice. What? Um, on As part of like him, like t- his sermon or whatnot. Yeah. And he, like, through the whole thing, he just keeps making these weird comments about, like, you know, it's a miracle. Nobody's talking about the miracle. And it's like, the miracle in his head is that they didn't, that he's still alive, right? Right. Uh, They could have killed him, I guess. Um, Wild. It's an absolutely wild story. I mean, look. I think we're going to hear more about this. I don't think anybody who has seen someone doing prosperity gospel bullshit I don't think anybody's surprised to learn that one of those doofuses is a scam artist. I think uh, that just like comports. a convicted one, right? Yeah, that's crazy. It, what's sad is how easily duped people are. Yeah, 
when yeah. people like know this like the story is out there now too right like yeah it, this is it is getting huge headlines right this the story that i was just referencing was from the new york times right like yeah everybody's paying attention to this story and so yeah so these 25 parishioners who showed up this last week they know about it yeah they do or at least they're or they're willfully ignorant like they've chosen not to learn more about him because right. it's out there. Well, the thing is that people love a redemption story, and I I think that that's a mm. a big mm. deal uh, for a lot of people. Well, I'm going to actually get to to that in a little bit, but yeah, if you find Jesus in uh, jail, people uh, just cannot get they lap that story up with a spoon. <laughs> they love it. Um, but before I get to that, I'm going to switch gears entirely and take us to uh, take us over the pond to wonderful uh, England, where the, uh, an event has occurred that it, it's like 14 years in the making. Oh, um, the uh, the Church of England, which is sort of one of uh, part one of the churches in the uh, Anglican Communion. It's run by, of course, the Archbishop of, Bishop of Canterbury. And the Anglican Communion, uh, you know, it includes the, the Episcopal Church and, uh, you know, Anglicans and uh, people, just groups all over the world. And they're supposed to have a meeting every so often, uh, a come together with everybody called Lambeth. And oh. they've, they've tried to have this a couple times, uh, but they haven't actually done it for 14 years. So it has been a minute since they had the uh, the Lambeth, um, and more than 650 bishops from around the world uh, registered to attend, mm. uh, including more than 100 from the Episcopal Church, which is mostly the United States and, Nor and uh, North America, I think. No, I think it's mostly the United States. Anywho, uh, there's also the Global South Church, and that's uh, a lot of like Africa and such. And the big thing that has prevented them from coming together, of course, has been that uh, the Episcopal Church and a few other uh, churches in the Anglican Communion have been like trying to be less jerks to <laughs> gay people, to people in the yeah. LGBTQ community, while the people in the, uh, the Global South group have been uh really really holding on to the idea of continuing their jerkdom uh so this has been the big wedge issue in the anglican communion it has threatened to tear them apart numerous times uh which they have not yet done and i don't and that's just crazy to me because just fucking kick them out anyway uh I guess here the truth of the matter is that the entire communion is very uh, is still not of one mind about this thing. They're very conflicted, mm -hmm. and uh, there the the plan was that they were going to vote on this topic, but they didn't. They they bunted. They decided to uh, no, no. We're going to put this off for somebody else to deal with. Well, yeah. Uh, it is apparently, I mean, it is a very intractable issue. You know what I mean? It's like, mm -hmm. and this is something that the Archbishop of Canterbury, Justin Welby, talked about and managed to actually like kind of keep things on a low simmer rather than boiling over at this Lambeth. Like the mm. last Lambeth it, it was in 98. Is that right? No. No. 14 years ago? 14. Okay. So this would have... This would have been a Lambeth, the Lambeth before that, back in 98. Um, they had a resolution which rejected homosexuality as incompatible with scripture, um, which is funny hmm. because <laughs> what a lot of them are doing now is rejecting scripture as incompatible with homosexuality, which is the correct way to do it. <laughs> and that's been sort of the, the prevailing document for a while now. Um, they were going to vote on a new human dignity document 
Um, but here's the thing. They were they started to go the wrong way with it. And and there, you know, before this Lambeth, there were a, a document circulated that was the wrong thing. It was like we still don't like gay people. We're we're not good at gays. Uh, I'm pretty sure that was the exact wording. We're not good at gays. We're not good at mm-hmm. gays. Mm-hmm. Uh, and and of course the Episcopal Church flipped out. And we're like, wait, why is this the document? What what are we doing here? Why is that the thing? So so now, uh, you know, old old Justin Welby, uh, he gave a big talk. Uh, apparently, and it was enough to satisfy everybody. He basically just said, look. Everybody thinks that they're very right on this, and the idea of switching their opinion on this is unthinkable, so mm, let's just pretend it doesn't exist. I mean, it's an interesting tactic for somebody trying to salvage the organization. Yeah. It's not the tactic of somebody who's standing up for what's right. No, but it feels um, but, very Church of England, doesn't it? <laughs> it feels so perfectly Anglican to be like, you have feelings and you have feelings, and let's just all just be friends. <laughs> regardless Our feelings of feelings can be different. Right. Regardless mm-hmm. of whether one of those person's feelings is about dehumanizing other humans. Right. Well, I mean, it's so... I'm sure part of the thinking is better to keep the the anti LGBT folk close so that maybe over time, you know, they we we can have an influence on them. Yeah. Is that maybe their thought? I don't know. I think I, their I thought doubt is I, just that's gonna happen. You no, know? of course that's not gonna happen. So really yeah. they're only I think their thought is something along the lines of maybe we can keep getting money from them for a while before we have to reject them. Well, I mean, nobody likes a schism, right? <laughs> Except for I the, love a good schism. Like, well, I as am an outsider, a schism fan. It's, it's awesome, right? You want to <laughs> see a schism if you're not part of the group. Yeah. But if you're part of it, like even if you're the righteous ones who are walking away, it can't feel great. No. You know? Yeah. Um, but whatever. All right, Dan. Yeah. Um, boy, this whole <sighs> libraries have become an interesting sort of focal point in our, yeah. in, in this country, right? Because we have the drag queen story hour that takes place in a lot of, a lot of libraries now where drag queens come in and they read to little kids and it's fun, right? Like it's this, you know, I believe you mean they're grooming little kids. <laughs> Yeah. Well, this is another story of grooming. Um, it's one of the uh, weakest cases for grooming I've heard. But um, a town up in Michigan, the Jamestown Township, has uh, voted to defund its own library uh, because <laughs> it was, quote unquote, grooming children for sexual abuse. Oh, my God. Now, now if that was the case... If there was this library in town that the community had been funding and there were uh, predators at the library, employees, yeah. it's, 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 this is absurd, right? Uh, who were grooming children for sexual abuse. You wouldn't defund the library. You'd fire everybody. You'd fire those folk and you would have the police uh, investigate and yeah, you prosecute. You exactly. do all of those things. That's how you handle that scenario, right? But that's not what's going on. No. What's going on is the library has the nerve to stock books that contain LGBTQ related themes. Right. That's it. These are just books on the shelf, and the library management is refusing to take the books down. That's it. And so the, the town voted and they, they voted to uh, not, uh, it doesn't sound like it's a full, full defunding, 
<laughs> but whatever sort of uh, funding the library was going for, uh, maybe it was a renewal of a bond or something that helps fund the library. I, I, I just didn't get those details from the story. Um, but whatever it is, um, the people voted against it and they voted against it because they believe that the, about 100 books that, that are on LGBTQ themes out of the 65,000 that are in the library right. um, are there as a threat to their children. I doubt that even a, the, what percentage of those books are even children's books. Right. Right. Um, anyway, the, the, the management, the board that runs the library is uh, standing firm. They refuse even in light of losing funding. Good. Um, this is from uh, Larry Walton. He's the library board president. He says, we stand behind the fact that our community is made up of a very diverse group of individuals. And we as a library cater to the diversity of our community. Uh, that is exactly right. And uh, so hopefully I they get, find some some way to fund this. <laughs> it's library. funny because because to me, to us, the idea of a library is, of course, an inherent good. It mm-hmm. is free a free way for people to get entertainment and get uh information and and it it like it is just obvious to people like you and me that that libraries are inherently positive right but information's people, a good thing right right but but a lot of these people uh do not share that view and believe that libraries it's not just that there are books that like t- teach children that gay humans exist, but it's also they teach children like other real things like evolution. And yeah. it, eventually they might educate themselves out of believing something, you know, yeah. that, that their parents want them to believe. So yeah, these people already had a beef, the people organizing yeah. this against the library, they already had a beef with the yeah. library. They've just yeah, found they, an argument. They finally found an argument that for whatever reason, people in the community are believing, right? It resonates with them. Well, um, and it, it was, it, it's amazing. It wasn't evolution, right? Right. The, the, and, and the other issues, like you were saying, that finally got people to really go after their local library. Well, what the a library win. is a fucking threat to these folks. What a big win for them that they managed to keep their kids from ever knowing about gay people. You did it. <laughs> Congratulations. They'll never find out. There's nothing else in the world that will expose them to the fact that there are LGBTQIA folk out there. Once you, once you eliminate the library, you, they're safe. Well done. <laughs> All right. Well, finally, I'm going to take us... Uh, he, I, I don't know if our listeners know this. Uh, I do know. They do know. Uh, but the U.S. has a federal prison system. Mm. Uh, it, we, we're, we're literally the best in the world at incarcerating. That's, oh, we, that is we something. Do it very we are well. number one yeah. in the world at locking up uh, our citizens. So go team. Uh, and <laughs> here in the U.S., there are some statistics that are kept on our prison uh, population um, within the federal prison system. So this isn't this isn't state and local uh, jails and prisons. This is just the the U.S. federal prison system. Uh, there are about one hundred and sixty thousand people in the federal prison system, uh, and of one hundred and fifty seven thousand six and sixty four people. Mm-hmm. How many would you say identify as atheist? Well, what what pop, what part of population are we now? Like, like we percent know? of yeah, of the, the U.S. Population? population? Yeah, We're, it, yeah. It depends on who you ask, but yeah. like, uh, just identifying as atheist, not including agnostics or sure. nuns or whatever. Okay. Yeah. It's probably about four percent. Four percent. Um, let's, yeah. Four percent, let's say. Okay, so you're saying that the prison population basically mirrors the population at large. Yeah, I don't think we're, you know, like atheists commit crimes, right? Sure. Yeah. Uh, the population, the the self-described atheists in the U.S. federal prison system, 
Zero point zero nine percent. A hundred and thirty four of the prisoners. What? Wow. So what is of it? Of one hundred and fifty seven thousand. Okay. I mean, do we know? Oh God. What are, what does it mean, right? Because it's well, like, we don't know do, what it means, unfortunately. And the, you know, Hammond Meta over at Only Sky is the one who who did the FOIA request to get this information. Oh, okay. And Hammond did a uh, very was very cautious about uh, how we should uh, interpret this data. Yeah, and that makes sense. Like you know, we don't know. There's just too many things that we don't know. To be able to say, you know, we don't know why people are in prison and we don't know, like, how being in prison. We do know that, like, in prison, a lot of people, uh, you, you know, there are actually benefits to calling yourself religious mm-hmm. or whatever. Yeah. Like, if you, if, you, if you say you're in a religious group, then you get time off on Sundays or whatever. Yeah. Um, they, there is a new wrinkle to it, which is that... Uh, as of very recently, the U.S. federal prison system has uh, ag- agreed to acknowledge humanism as mm. one of the options. Okay. Uh, and therefore, so there are some people who uh, who ad- call themselves humanists rather than, uh, and, and so that may uh, skew things. But even if you add the humanists into the, uh, onto the, the atheists, um, it's still a fraction of a percent of yeah. the prison population. It's 0.1% at that point. Yeah. Wow. So uh, I'm, I, here's, what I, here's what I would conclude. Uh, you, there's way too many uh, factors to actually make any broad conclusions other than I, I think you have to say that if it is that big of a difference, atheists commit fewer crimes. I think I have to, I, I think, I think there's no way around. The number is so yeah. significantly lower than the, than the number of people in the general population. Well, how, how about this as a takeaway? Right. Uh, you know, uh, if you would, if you would believe what a lot of religious folk think and say about atheists, you would think that we would be out there committing crimes in large numbers. Right. Right. Yeah, um, because they so say that the, 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 the all morality shows, is based on yeah. on on Jesus or whatever. So yeah. how could we possibly have any morality? Exactly. What this says to me is that that's that that claim is just completely bunk. Yeah, right? the, you the, literally that is, that is, can't possibly make that claim. Yeah. Um, or and, there is another possibility. Mm. Atheists are just so much smarter at getting away with crime. <laughs> We're like so much better at it. Just diabolical. We're literally like maybe Satan is helping or whatever, but we are criminal geniuses. <laughs> you can't catch us. <clears throat> We're all out there doing crime all the time. And these religious ding dongs can't catch us. Why do I kind of not have a problem with that? If that was, <laughs> if that was true. I love it. <clears throat> I love it. Oh, then we're right. Like, well, we're talking. This is a good caper. This is a yeah. This, this is a good story. I like this story. Yeah, obviously exactly. not true, but uh, well, listen, uh, listeners, if you have a crime that you would like to tell us about that you got away with, uh, feel free write into us podcast at thankgodimatheist.com or call and leave us a voicemail message. The telephone number is four two four six 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 eight four four two. Stick around, we've got more show coming up. Okay, Frank. Dan. Here's the thing. Mm-hmm. Here's the, I have you ever heard I only became recently became aware of this. Um the prophet of the Mormon church, the current prophet, mm-hmm. a, a, a glorious asshole named Russell Nelson, mm-hmm. just a real jerk of a human. Mm-hmm. Here's the thing. Uh, for, those of, for those listeners who've, who don't have experience with Mormonism, all of the higher ups in, Mormon, uh, in Mormondom have, they always tell faith affirming stories 
They mm. un- they realize the power of a story. And so they're constantly, at, you know, in, in their talks and in their speeches at general conference and whatever, they're constantly telling stories about Sister Wendy was a blah, blah, blah. And, and, and they're always lies. They're very clearly not true. Mm-hmm. Um, but every now and then one tells a story, not just about sister so-and-so, but about themselves. Right. And, uh, Russell Nelson had a story. I didn't know this, but he has been telling this story for like decades. And I okay. am going to, uh, I, so our audio today is going to be, uh, the, from the church's own, uh, release. It is, it is Russell Nelson telling us. It, uh, this story, oh, God. and then and then I'm going to tell you what was recently discovered about it. <laughs> okay. I was in a small airplane, and all of a sudden, the engine on the wing caught fire. It exploded, and burning oil was poured all over the right side of the airplane, and we started to dive toward the earth. We were spinning down to our death. Oh, this woman across the aisle, I I just was so sorry for her. She was just absolutely uncontrollably hysterical. And I was calm. I was totally calm. Even though I knew I was going down to my death, I was ready to meet my maker. We didn't crash. We didn't die. The spiral dive extinguished the flame. The pilot got control and started the other engine up. And we made an emergency landing out in the field. But I thought through that experience, if you've got a faith, you can handle difficulties, knowing that with an eternal perspective that all will be well. Well, isn't that amazing, Frank? Oh, he wasn't beautiful. afraid to die. His delusion saved him. Oh, just, oh. He would, he, but he was calm. <laughs> By the way, that fucking sing-songy, like, talking to a children voice, Ugh. that's how he, that's how he talks to his church. Yeah. Ugh. Ugh. Infuriating. It is, it, it's, it, it's so infantilizing. Anyway, turns out it's all lies. What? <laughs> it's bullshit. He wasn't uh, almost in a crash. He has he has basically told this story so many times, and he keeps adding little uh, flourishes, little embellishments, and then oh. recently he retold it, uh, and he included some information about what he was on his way to do, what the what he was going to do, which gave exact dates or roughly exact dates Uh-oh. and uh, exact like trajectories. So he is on his way from Salt Lake to St. George, Utah. For the inauguration of a uh, the president of a college down there, okay. at, where he was going to give a prayer or whatever, and okay. uh, that was enough because maybe he has not realized this, but every incident that happens with an airplane has oh. to be recorded. Oh, absolutely, and has to be documented. Mm-hmm. So some uh, internet sleuths were like, oh. Okay, well, we know what date it was. Let's just dive in now. And no, it turns out that the only thing that's even similar, it was uh, not like the day before or the day after he was claiming it was. And it was literally, it, there was a, ti- a very small plane, a twin engine uh, plane that was flying between Salt Lake and St. George mm-hmm. with three passengers on board. He has claimed that there were four. Uh, at various times, but okay. that's fine. Three passengers on board. Uh, there was a, a little bit of a rough engine issue. Uh, the plane was fi- flying just fine, but uh, a, as per company instructions uh, in the manual, the uh, the pilot landed at a small airstrip in Delta and checked it out. And that is literally the story. <laughs> Definitely uh, not... He- he wasn't Not on quite the plane. flames. He was. He may have been on the plane. Oh, okay. But it, it didn't land in a field. There was no fire. There was no the. There was no explosion. It. There was no death spiral tumbling towards the earth. He literally just made it all up. Why would he do that? Uh, because it's cool. <laughs> Sounds cool. 
He, he probably pretty, stole the story from someone. He probably <laughs> that's did. That's a classic maneuver too. Like plenty of those those guys have borrowed. Yeah, stories. He he had a buddy who was who was the coolest guy he ever met, who was a pilot in World War II, and was telling him a story or something. Anyway, uh, okay, so Mormons are full of shit. That's uh, even even their top Mormon is full of shit. Well, yeah. So I mean, Thomas S. Monson was like su- like if half the stories that he told happened in some form, right? <laughs> I would be amazed. Yeah, and clearly embellishments. Like you just you sorry right and then there was paul h dunn who like actually was caught because he Uh was telling all sorts of like foxhole stories from what world war ii or something yeah um i can't also claim he played professional baseball or something yeah he totally lied about a whole bunch of stuff (laughs) and they they figured it out he got caught and he quietly went away yeah Um, like this is nothing new you just have to be smart about it and you, yeah, he, he would have been much better if this had just been like a, he was on a Greyhound bus, you know, yeah. for St. George. Oh my God. <laughs> there you go. Oh, okay. Well, we had some folks write into us. Uh, Anna wrote in to say, hi, Frank and Dan. Thanks for your stories on Christian, on the Christian right. Hmm. So many pastors seem to agree with Kent Christmas. We've played several Kent Christmas audio lately. That Donald Trump was reelected in the court of God mm. and that he's the real president in the eyes of God. <laughs> it's very sad that he doesn't get to serve his second term eating hamburgers in the White House, but it's very nice that he is serving his second term according to God, which makes him ineligible for a run against a run again in 2024. <laughs> Yes, I love yep. that. Yep. I'm like, oh, I, he, he that's did. uh that's your own thing, you guys. You're the one that made him ineligible. Yeah. According to you. Term so. limited in yeah. heaven. So that let's say he does get elected in 2024. He won't get a third term in heaven. No, no. Yeah. yeah. Well, me I, I don't know. He may run for president of heaven. <laughs> and he would definitely be elected then for sure. <sighs> Lord Jesus. All right. Um, Fred wrote into us. Uh, Fred said Fred said a bunch of nice things, including uh, we're going to be thanking Fred in just a second. But Fred, uh, one, one, th- one part of his email said, I have been fascinated with Mormons for a long time. Who hasn't? Uh, I like that your show, while not exclusively in that vein, is informative about the faith. I have a question you might know the answer to. I have heard that a certain number of young men in the fundamentalist settlements like Colorado City are driven from the community since the old perverts are marrying all the young girls uh, they might otherwise hook up with. Mm. I guess they often end up homeless and poorly educated for the modern world. Sounds real tragic. How the hell did that work out back in the early days of Utah settlement? It seems they would have had the same issue on an even larger scale. In my reading about the settlement of Utah, I have never heard that aspect of plural marriage society addressed. Hmm. I think that's, I've never thought of that either. Like, I don't, do you have any thoughts on this? Because yes, you're, uh, Fred is absolutely right that yeah. like in the FLDS community, there are the, there's this phenomenon called the lost boys Yeah, where they literally, you know, these boys were raised in this insanely insular community. They have no knowledge of the outside world. They might as well have been Amish. Mm-hmm. And then they're just kicked out. Yeah. And they, they often end up homeless and they end up uh, really struggling. Yeah. But so, yeah. So how would it work if it was on a wider, like in old, old West Utah, right? Yeah. With uh, I f- I feel like running around. I feel like then you just, you just realize that, you know, you're one of the unfavored males. Yeah. And you you just have a bachelor farm for the rest of your life. <laughs> or you, or yeah, you I'm, one, I'm not yeah. sure exactly. I, it is a good question. I've never really heard it discussed. Um, but one thing is I don't, aside from like way hires, way hires up in the church, 
polygamy wasn't such an exaggerated thing of like having 40 or 50 wives, right? Like, like the men had to support all, all of yeah. those wives and kids and everything. So they had to be like well positioned, so forth and so on. I don't think it was, it wasn't like, not everybody practiced polygamy who was Mormon male and in Utah, right? No, but it is still a problem. Like the numbers are still an issue. Even if it's yeah. only, you know, the wealthy guys get, you know, 10 to 20. The the top, top dog, Brigham Young himself gets 50. Yeah. And then, you know, even if lower echelon Mormon men are, are you know, are getting two. Yeah. We still have a huge numbers problem. That is, yeah. No, yeah. No, that's. Yeah. I don't know. But you don't hear wanna, about that I, story. You don't hear. I want someone to write to write that book. Where you know what I mean? That I want someone to dig down and find the journals and the diaries yeah. of these rejected men. Because huh. yeah, I mean, polygamy was off, obviously awful for most of the women involved. But <laughs> there's there's a a big group of men who didn't get wives. It's funny that nobody was like. That nobody was like, uh, it, you know, higher up in in Mormonism and these practitioners of polygamy, that nobody saw the obvious, which was, why don't we promote homosexuality too? Right? Right. <laughs> Perfect. Problem solved, right? Well, I mean, obviously that must have been something that happened. <laughs> <laughs> you know. Uh, yeah, brother Johnson had, and brother and brother Brown, uh, who both neither of whom ended up with ladies, in part because they weren't really that interested in them. Uh, <laughs> they must have been real good friends, those two. Uh, Anywho, uh, Fred, thank you for your email and thank you so much. Yeah, Fred is a a, a patron and gave us a one time donation, uh, <laughs> ostensibly to make up for the fact that he only just discovered our show and feels like he should have been listening from the beginning so thank you so much Fred uh, for being one of our prophets seers and revelators uh, we we appreciate that do we have some other folks to thank we do indeed Dan we have two new patrons over on Patreon uh, we have a new deacon by the name of Rogue Wizard <laughs> Ooh. So, thank you that, I mean that that it sounds like they've already got magic powers and now <laughs> we uh, we're, we're bestowing upon them the magic powers of a 12 year old Mormon boy. So good job <laughs> you and congratulations. <laughs> and we have a new teacher uh, by the name of Peter. Uh, so thank Excellent. you, Peter. And if you'd like to join them and uh, show your support for the show, please go to our website. Thank God I'm atheist.com and click on the support tab. And as always, Dan, we have our top donor to thank our Lord and savior. Davis! Stick around. There's more show coming right up. All right, Frank. Mm -hmm. We we talked to we you know we played some Mormon speak for you earlier. Yee. And that boy, that audio, it has the the typical Mormon like overly heartfelt piano chords under it. We didn't even acknowledge that bit. Boy, it is just nauseating. I'm sorry for all of you that we triggered with that one, all you yeah. ex-Mormons. You got to feel uh, it, though, Dan. They you gotta, need yes. you to feel it. <laughs> you got you gots to feel it. Uh, listen, Mormonism isn't all good, though. You'll be shocked to learn what? that there might be a negative side, a dark uh, underbelly lurking in Mormonism. It's not just Mormonism, obviously. We've often said, you and I, Frank, that if you have a diocese, a Catholic diocese near you, you got a pedophilia, you, you, you got, you got a, a sex abuse problem. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, it's just It's just a numbers game at that point. Well, basically, if you have any insular religious organization that has a vested interest in protecting its image, you've got a sex abuse problem. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, but some just haven't gotten uh, gotten called out very much yet, and and sort of you know we 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 only just started learning about how the how deep the the Catholic well goes and how many ways they had of protecting themselves. Mm-hmm. And by protecting, I don't mean protecting their uh, the victims. Oh, I mean no. protecting the perpetrators. Yes, clearly. So Mormonism has just, uh, 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 there was an AP article that came out uh, this week that really uh, is not a good look for the Mormons. And it's not even about Mormon clergy sexually abusing. Mm. Um, That is very certainly a problem. It happens all the time and is not talked about and is not, and you know, the the, the Mormons definitely cover it up. But that's not what we're talking about. What we're talking about is that in Mormonism, like in Catholicism, there is a similar concept to confession. Uh, it's not actual confession. It's not confession in the same way that Catholics do it. But Mormons are expected to sort of say their sins to their bishop. And uh, their bishop is then in a bit of a, you know, they're, you know, they're, and they're supposed to go to their bishop for guide, guidance and uh, spiritual help. Because, mm-hmm. you know, this lay person who has no training. Right. Who has any any possible job other than actually just being clergy. Anything. Yeah. Banker, yeah. plumber. Yeah. Mormon is Mormon car salesman. clergy. A Mormon bishop is just the guy whose turn it is. <laughs> yeah. It's not somebody, it's not someone with any training whatsoever. So what does a Mormon bishop do when someone comes in and confesses to him that they have been sexually abusing their own children. And here's the thing. The Mormon church has set up a helpline for their bishops to give the, to give the bishops guidance. You know that. I mean, that sounds like a good thing. It does sound like a good thing. Because like what we were just talking about, these guys don't have the training, right? They don't know. They don't know what to do. So they've got a resource. So you this call the, sounds good. Yeah. And you call the helpline. And, you know, if it were me creating a helpline for this kind of a thing where, you know, you've got someone in there who, uh, who has admitted some very awful thing that they do, the person on the other end of that helpline, I would say social worker, maybe psychologist, any number of things. Not if you're Mormon, though. <laughs> If you're Mormon, it's lawyers. Oh, yeah, and, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, and these lawyers are not representatives of, you know, the bishop or what they represent the church. Yeah. And they are there to keep the church safe in that scenario. So the guidance that they provide is what you are legally allowed not to do. Oh boy. So so but, the, the, but the, they present as you don't do because that was the thing that I caught yeah. when reading it was, was that it is um, this, the clergy exemption for, you know, telling the, the, the authorities about, uh, you know, sex abuse crimes. Right. Th- that exemption says that they, they may uh, uh, keep it from the police. Right. Depending on sort of the situation. And the way the lawyers tell them is they absolutely in, in no way can they reveal what, what is told to them in these confidential clergy, you know, confessional sessions. Yeah. Uh, and not, mind you, not every state uh, in the U.S. and not every place has a clergy yep. penitent privilege. Sure. So these lawyers are familiar with uh, the laws in each of the states. So they'll make sure that, you know, on a base level, there is some compliance, but here's the thing. But like the idea is that yes, dude who is a plumber who happens to be, whose turn it is to be the clergy for the parish now 
his buddy from down the street, you know what I mean? His yeah. friend that he's known from church for X number of years comes in and says, hey, I, I do this awful thing. That's a terrible position to be in, period. But yeah, to then for them then to call their church and say, what do I do? And have the church say, yeah, you're, you're good. Don't do anything. Yeah. That is astounding. And then the abuse goes on. And then in the case of at least one, so they, you know, this AP article discusses a specific case in which a girl who was at the time five years old Mm. when her father first confessed, Mm. uh, she continued to be abused by her father for seven years. Jesus Christ. Before, before anything happened. Uh, and and this guy was particularly awful. I'm not going to go into the details because yeah. it's very triggering and it's it's uh it's particularly gruesome and awful. Uh and there were so many places along the way where someone could have easily put a stop to it. Yeah. Well, but, this bishop. Uh, <laughs> and that's the first yeah. one. Yeah. This bishop could have ended that and didn't. I don't know how anyone could hear a story like that from the mouth of the perpetrator and not put a stop to it. (sighs) Well, you do what the church says. Yeah. And in this case, he figured that the church's lawyers were going to give him good guidance. Yeah. We're, we're, yeah. I mean, they were lawyers. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, you're, you call a number that the church tells you to call. You're calling the church. Yeah. The person there on the other end doesn't identify, I am an attorney who will give you legal guidance, blah, blah, blah. They probably just say, okay, here's what you can do. Or he, or you don't have to do anything, so don't. Yeah. It's, it's just astounding. And again, I want to reiterate, like this scandal, which deserves to be a scandal, and uh, I hope, and boy, <laughs> there was a really fun moment when the church in in a PR sort of in a, in a damage control PR move did a, a twit, a Twitter thread about it. Oh boy. And uh, because they were, because they were in crisis mode, uh, whoever did the Twitter thread forgot to, uh, to put it on no comments mode. So somebody immediately, of course, commented, you pieces of shit, why are you doing this? Or something like that. Right. So then they they couldn't figure out how to delete. They can't, you know, they can't delete that comment. So they deleted their, so they, you know, they immediately threw on the no comments thing. Hmm. They, you know, they, they turned off comments for that thread, but they had this one tweet hanging out there that was like, you pieces of shit. So then they delete the tweet that that's a response to, which is funny because they've deleted part of their tweet tweet, tweet thread. So there's a, a missing thing. So it doesn't make full sense. But somehow in deleting that tweet, they turned comments back on. <laughs> so then oh, people wow. went after them again. It was it was it was a bit of a debacle. Eventually, they deleted the whole thing and then re. Uh, re-uploaded the the thread so they didn't have their social media manager in the room (laughs) right (laughs) who knew how the thing worked right they had they had the guy three down who like was a bishop yeah (sighs) anyway uh yeah i i hope this shreds them political like like i i I hope that people can can see a little because honestly this is just the tiniest peek behind the curtain yeah. This is literally again. This isn't even about the clergy committing the crimes, which we know happens all the time and we don't see reports about it. Yeah. So like there's there's a much bigger chunk of this iceberg below the surface. This is just one small look at something awful that's happening. So, <sighs> yeah. I, uh, you know, I, it, it's one of those things where it's just more confirmation that if you, just because you don't hear about something awful happening, if you have a, a religion 
if you have an organization that deals with uh, deep emotions and that deals with people of all ages and that, you know, unfortunately, religions are just sort of prime places for this kind of abuse to happen. Mm. Yeah. And so if you've got a big enough religion, and by big enough, I mean, you know, more than three congregations, chances are you've got a sex abuse problem in there somewhere. And they're covering it up. It's, I, just a yeah. fa- it's just how it works. I don't care if it's Buddhist. I, I mean, Scientology obviously has this. I, just, it's just an, an issue. And they're not, they're not going to be open about it. They're not going to be honest about it until they're caught. Right. Because so, uh, it makes them look bad and they don't want to. You have to protect the organization. You have to protect the org. Yeah. So there you Gross. go. Mormons are as bad as everybody else. I mean, we, we know it. Yep. I just, it is remarkable to me though. Like hearing the details of it, it's like, oh, that's so Mormon. Right. It oh, seems yeah. all clean and official and everything, but then as soon as you dig a little under the, the surface, it's like, oh no, it was just a team of lawyers at, you know, Kirkland McConkie or whatever the name of the, their, yeah. <laughs> their law firm is. And I'll say this, you know, the Deseret News, which is a church-owned newspaper uh, here in Utah, they published an, an op-ed, a very quick emergency op-ed by a lawyer who used to work in that team. Oh, yeah? And she did this whole thing. And, you know, she's got the bona fides coming. Because let me tell you something. The church doesn't hire ding-dong lawyers. <laughs> They've got $150 billion. They can afford the good lawyers. Sure, yeah. But they, so, and she was like, you know what? These This is a team of people who are dedicated to stopping abuse and they of course they don't want abuse and i i actually believe that i believe that for the most part nobody wants there to be child abuse no no of course not but the fact that this could have happened and did happen at all and we know it didn't just happen once uh is and the fact that it it, that there is a helpline populated with lawyers and not with social work, not with, you know, the kinds of people who could actually give advice that could help in this in, in this scenario, rather than protect the church, uh, is, is statement enough. That's all you need to know. So I, I, I feel like, I, you know, I, I don't even have to not believe, I don't even have to, like, disbelieve that these people don't want there to be child abuse. For to know that there's that it's still uh, that they're still coming at it from the wrong perspective, and they're evil, or at least they're perpetuating evil in the world. Right. Anyway, that that's our perspective. If you have your own perspective on it uh, that you'd like to share with us, we would love to hear it. Please write into us podcast at thankgodimatheist.com. or call and leave us a voicemail message. The telephone number is four two four six 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 eight four four two. Yeah. Uh, hey, look, you're on the internet. Go to the Facebook page, facebook.com slash TGI Atheist. Click the like button. You're going to be glad you did. <laughs> and if you'd like to join one of our members only lounges, you can do so. Go to our website, thankgodimatheist.com slash members only. Yeah. Hey, thanks so much to the Red Rock Hot Club for the use of their fine music. And thanks to Gordon Johnston for the use of his music. And thanks to all of y'all for tuning in. We sure do like it when you do. Thanks so much. Bye-bye.